So uh, my name is Nick Gowing, <coughs> Nick Gowing and um, this is such a critical issue for India still about uh, rural entrepreneurship and employment, livelihood, work, jobs, whatever we want to call it, particularly because uh, two-thirds of the Indian population uh, still lives in rural areas, although the definition of rural areas is beginning to change, and uh, particularly with the migration now to, to the cities too. Now, what I'd like to do is ask uh, all the six panelists to explain in less than a minute why they're on the, on the panel so that uh, we can get a sense of why they are going to talk about employment, livelihood, work, jobs in the rural areas and rural entrepreneurship. So uh, let's move, first of all, to uh, Opie Bhatt. And I'd literally a maximum of a minute, please. Good morning. Uh, the reason I'm here and we have interest in the subject is that we are India's largest socio-economic development institution. There is nobody else which comes even a close second, apart from some of the governments, including the central government. We've been at it for a long time. We have a network of about 18,000 branches, and we have reached out to more than 100,000 unbanked villages in an attempt to provide financial inclusion to these villages. But what I am realizing, and what we are increasingly realizing is, that while financial inclusion has become the buzzword in India, and there is a lot of effort at pushing financial inclusion, the right kind of effort, the right kind of technology, the right kind of investment, the right kind of ecosystem has been created for this. But what I am beginning to realize is that financial inclusion is just one necessary but not sufficient step. We need to move ahead from financial inclusion to economic inclusion. And I think that distance, even in thought, has still not been fully traveled in India, much less in action down on the ground. So that is one of the learnings that I have had from this experiment that we've been doing at State Bank of India for the past few years. And the other uh, impression that I get is that in India, in many ways, banks are in the vanguard of uh, this activity. But what I also realize is that banks can at best play a supportive or a supplementary role. There need to be a host of other agencies, both government and non-government, to provide the right. right outreach. Your minute is up. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, hear uh, your, your responsibilities uh, and where your organization fits into this critical issue of rural entrepreneurship. Arvind Myram. Uh, I am here because I am working with the Ministry of Rural Development, which is uh, mandated to look after the issues of development in the rural areas. We spend about $25 billion a year in uh, different schemes of rural development. Uh, I have been part of the team which is working now in redesigning the way rural development is done, especially by bringing in the private sector in a public-private uh, partnership mode. And this public-private partnership is of a nature where our relationship with the private sector is commercial, whereas our objective are very public. Ellen Kuhlman. So Just bring the microphone a little closer, A can little you? closer, thank you. You know, DuPont being a market-driven science company, we put our science to work to solve some of the world's toughest problems, and one of those is around agricultural productivity. With growth in the population, we're going to need about 50 or 100 percent more food from the same amount of land in the next 50 years. And so that's going to take not only technology, but it's going to take new business models. So we've in, we're investing in research centers, both in hybridization and things like corn and rice here um, in India, um, as well as a knowledge center that does both agricultural biotechnology and crop protection science. Um, and we have people deployed throughout the company. Uh, country working in private-public partnerships, working directly with farmers or other NGOs to really advance agricultural productivity. Elizabeth Comstock. Yes, uh, I'm I head up uh, Innovation for GE, and uh, we're a high technology company focused on big technology, think uh, locomotives, aircraft engines, energy, healthcare, and uh, most people when you think that, you think it's applied more to urban settings, and the reality is that, uh, that the rural area presents a big opportunity because there's such vast need. Uh, we try to take our technology, focus it on these big problems, health, infrastructure, energy generation. I'd say what we find is the best uh, innovation comes about by defining the problem that you're trying to solve. And when you look at, at India with two-thirds of the population in rural areas, the problems are vast uh, and they are being defined. Um, and for a company like GE, a lot of what we're, we're looking at are cost, 
access, mobility, and scalability. And are you involved already significantly uh, in the Indian rural scene? We are, especially in the healthcare and energy space. Good, which okay. Which I can get into. Good, Ben Vivan. So uh, first of all, the world needs a vibrant India. We talk about a country of 1.2 billion people, and we absolutely need uh, India as, uh, as part of the world and the growth in the world. India started to grow when they combined mm talent and connectivity with the world. And I think the next wave, it cannot just be the urban part of India that participates. The next wave is that we have to add to that the potential of the rural areas. That's why I'm here. Uh, but what does Alcatel Lucent do at the moment in the Indian rural areas? So if you talk about connectivity, think about this. 15 years ago, the penetration of voice telephony was 1% in India. Today, it's 70%. If you look today, the penetration of internet is 1%. We need to see in the coming five to seven years the same penetration as you have seen in, um, in voice because that will allow people to use their skills, use public services and commercial services combined to develop uh, the rural areas. Right, Tiram Raghavan. Uh, I'm here because uh, we run a business that delivered government that enable delivering of government and private services uh, to, uh, to people in uh, rural areas. We uh, served over 10 million customers, uh, primarily in southern India. And I'm here to talk about and argue uh, the point that there are jobs beyond agriculture in rural areas. Um, we can talk about um, agriculture as being, uh, as employing 57% of the workforce, contributing 17% of GDP. That's one end of it. But I think there, is, there are opportunities right beyond it. An example of that would be uh, you know, what I call micro-infrastructure services. In rural areas, if you've all been, you've seen you know, homes are poorly built, there aren't enough plumbers, contractors. So my argument is that there are opportunities for people to move to the service industry and, uh, and serve the rural economy and create employment. So uh, I'm here to talk about that and uh, contribute to the panel. Thank you. Let me just be clear, Comat Technologies, a leading provider of e-governance solutions, right. particularly in the rural area? Only in rural areas, so. Okay, good. Right, let's move on. I've asked them each to come up with um, uh, three to four minutes only at this moment of ideas of the way ahead for innovating rural entrepreneurship, jobs, um, livelihood. We've just been having this discussion outside. Is it jobs, livelihood, work? How do we de define it? Um, and I've urged them to come up with at least one new or big idea which we can discuss in the next hour. Uh, so let's go to OP Buck, please. Um, your, your view of the way ahead for innovation. Yeah. Uh, so let me just scope out the nature of the problem, both in terms of quantity and quality or in terms of numbers and concerns. The rural population in India is roughly 700 million which is two and a half times the population of Europe or America. If you were to look at the number of poor alone, the number of poor is about 300 million people, equal to the population of Europe or America. So that is the, the size of the problem that we have in India. If you were to go down a little bit further, the poor are defined roughly, broadly, as people who live on less than a dollar a day. So in India, there are hundreds of millions of people, maybe 100 million plus, who live on less than a dollar a day. Imagine less than a dollar a day, but that is the average number. There are people in this country who live at less than half a dollar a day, half a dollar a day, deprived, diseased, despaired. They don't have even one square meal a day, forget two square meals a day. And these people are also numbering in more than 100 million. So that is the scale that we have. It is these people, when they get loans from, say, the banking system, and when for whatever reason, it could be market, it could be monsoons, that they're not able to repay the, uh, the loan, it could be marriage, it could be death, it could be a health problem. So when this guy is not able to repay a bank loan or a loan from the formal system, doors are closed. Then he goes to the informal system, it could be money lenders or others. Now he goes to the informal system when he's at his weakest. He goes to the informal system when not only he has a debt, but there is interest piling up on that debt. And then he takes another debt at a higher rate of interest. When this second debt he is not able to repay, and when there is pressure for repayment coming both from the money lender, whatever he is, and increasingly now since many of these loans are given by way of joint liabilities coming from peer pressure, that is what when, uh, this is when uh, what I can describe happens is the suicide point. 
lot of suicides which are taking place in rural India, they happen at this point of time. And this is something that we need to understand when we talk about innovation, innovating new methods of you know, trying to get livelihood or employment to the poor. The third point I want to make it is that India is growing at 8.8% and everybody is very proud, especially we Indians. But it is not uniformly growing at 8.8%. Maybe there is one or two percent people who are growing at 50% plus, real estate, share market, whatever it is. And maybe there are five to 10% people who are growing at 25% plus. Maybe there is 20, 30% people who's growing between 10 and 20%. Maybe there are some people who are growing at 8.8%. But there is 20, 30, 40% people who are growing at 8.8 or less and some who are actually growing down, whose incomes is growing down. They're having less this year than they had last year. And these numbers would be in tens of millions, if not in hundreds of millions. So if you look at the numbers, if you look at the quality of life of these people, if you look at what is happening despite this 8.8% growth, we do not have inclusive growth. And if it is not inclusive, we will not have sustainable growth, which means that we may not be safe in our homes, and in our cars, there are about 150 districts in India across a large swath of Bihar and Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh and all that, where there, is, there are law and order issues, where there are naxalite problems, and this number over a period of time has actually grown. So this is in terms of quality and quantity, the scope of the issue that we have at hand, and I suppose it imparts enough urgency and direction to the discussion that we are going to have. Thanks. Thank you very much. I mean, this, this important issue of slow growth and limited opportunities and how you create forces that generate more growth and increase the opportunities to keep people in the uh, rural areas. Ar Arvin Maram. Actually, if you look at the problem, it is a combination of everything that has been said here today. Uh, connectivity, digital connectivity is an issue, and I think also a great opportunity, but connectivity in itself is a problem. For instance, roads, that also is a big problem. Drinking water is a problem. So what we are looking at is a situation where a large number of people from rural areas are continuously migrating into the cities because there aren't enough opportunities. And enough opportunities are not happening because the infrastructure in rural areas is inadequate, which includes connectivity. So how do you ad we address this issue where we are actually spending about $25 billion, as I said, every year in different schemes of rural development, and yet we are not finding the kind of return that we should be getting on that investment in terms of growth in the rural areas and growth especially in the opportunities for people to be able to uh, earn their livelihoods right there in where they are. So what we ha have done is we have redesigned the way this is done and we are running a few pilots which I think are of great interest to the country. They will, they will be a paradigm shift if we are successful in doing that in the manner in which infrastructure and provision of services is done in the rural areas. Many of you may have heard of this uh, scheme which was earlier announced by, uh, which is a concept by the former president Abdul Kalam uh, called provisioning of urban amenities in rural areas. Earlier it was a very good concept. It hadn't been fleshed out in the manner in which it could be implemented as a scheme. Now we have come up with a public-private partnership scheme and we are rolling out some projects uh, on that as pilots. We have combined, and it's a very interesting design, because we have combined several government schemes into a project. And we have bid out this project to the private sector. In fact, we were surprised. We wanted to do about 10 pilots. And in the expression of interest, we got about 93 expressions of interest from very large Indian private sector companies. Uh, this is a complex project. This is first time, and we were trying to find out this is the first time something like this is being uh, attempted in the entire world. And therefore, we were not actually looking at this kind of a, a response. What is going to happen is this. The, service, the infrastructure, which includes the, the civic infrastructure in villages, select villages, will be developed by the private sector where the financing will come from the government scheme. So the private sector will spend actually the government money 
to create the infrastructure. Private sector would invest in creating economic activity in these particular areas. And over a period of 10 years, after three years of construction period, the private sector would also be responsible for the maintenance and provision of services through a concession agreement which they will sign with the government. And they would also be tied to predetermined service level standards which they will have to maintain when they are providing these services. Our estimation is that we have about 250,000 panchayats, that is the local bodies, covering about 600,000 habitations in the country. And if we were to uh, club these panchayats on a, in, on a population base of about 30,000, which we think is a viable uh, area, then we are basically looking at an investment from the government, an additional investment from the government from what already exists of something of the order of 30 to 35 uh, uh, billion dollars. And over a period of five years, it is quite doable, five or 10 years. The difference in this model of public-private partnership in rural areas is we are expecting the private sector to come into these projects on commercial considerations. There's a return on their investment. They, uh, and we have done a business model, a financial model on that, uh, which is doable. And we expect that this would be a business relationship with the private sector so that this model is sustainable and scalable. The only problem now we are look, seeing is whether there would be adequate capacity in the private sector to come into uh, these projects if we scale it up to the entire country. Uh, because then there would be a very large commitment that private sector would also have to make into the, these projects. And that's one area which is of concern to us. And we, would be, we are engaging with the private sector to see how we can move forward. Once this uh, kind of a relationship is established, we believe we would have addressed several problems that are now afflicting the civic services, uh, not only in rural areas, also in urban areas, but now concentrating on rural areas. One is maintenance of assets which are created, because large number of assets are created through public monies, where maintenance becomes a problem. So you would see road after road which is completed in rural areas uh, falling to seed over a period of three to four years because there's no maintenance. Uh, the problem of providing services which are accountable in terms of standards, in terms of quality, uh, that uh, is the second part of it. The third part of it is the efficiencies that private sector can bring in the provision and, uh, of these infrastructure and services in the rural areas. I would add, hasten to add that uh, this includes also the digital connectivity that you have just spoken of. Uh, we are looking at uh, also the digital connectivity. In fact, I think by 2012 March, this is what I'm told by the Department of Telecom, uh, all panchayats, which is 250,000 panchayats, will be connected by broadband, uh, which is March of 2012. So this is not too far from here. And I believe that if we move forward in this manner, uh, to a great extent, we would be able to create sustainable livelihoods in the rural areas, which, which would also reduce the rate of migration from rural to urban areas. And just to be clear, are you getting any kind of readout at all feedback on, on the principle and, uh, and its effectiveness? Uh, to the extent that we have tested this, uh, uh, this concept in the field, in the market, the response of private sector has been very good. And when I'm saying private sector, I'm talking of large private sector companies who have experience of uh, doing infrastructure and provisioning of infrastructure. They have shown a lot of interest in this, uh, this particular concept. However, we still need to see as we go down the line as to how it uh, rolls out into the... Into and how quickly do you think you'll get a readout on its effectiveness? A year or two? Uh, our concessions will be signed by the middle of January of 2011. Okay, good. Let me just get a, a view from, uh, another view from uh, the rural areas from Siram Raghavan. Sure. Uh, your, your perspective um, as a for-profit uh, social enterprise. So the... So I agree with uh, Mr. Buck and Mr. Mayaram that, that, that growth needs to be inclusive. I mean, if you want to grow at 9%, uh, we need to take the rural economy with us, no question about it. And if you think about sort of economic terms, total factor productivity, we need to use technology, increase productivity of agriculture. 
All that's uh, understood, I'm sure Ellen's gonna talk more about that. My, uh, the point I wanna make is I think what's happening today is government, in my opinion, needs to stay out of trying to create these enterprises. I think government needs to enable these enterprises, but they need to stay out of doing it themselves. And the reason I bring it up is, uh, you know, what's happening, the great program, and I'm sure Mr. Amaram knows about this much better than I do, which is called the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which, which sort of guarantees 100-day employment every one. Uh, my fear is that these programs are designed to sort of work in perpetuity. And what we have to be careful is when we design these programs to have flexibility in these programs so that over a period of time, people can come out of the social security net. And I think this is a great net at this point. I think this is what we need in India right now to get people above. But I think at some point, they've got to get out of this net and create opportunities for themselves. And so, like, like Mr. Maram said, there's lots of infrastructure, support services that are required in rural areas. I think people need to maintain homes and roofing and plumbing and all the stuff that's required, and people need to go do all that. And, and, the, and the point I want to make to you is that government has to enable uh, provision of such, sort of create such, uh, help, create an environment for such entrepreneurs to sort of flourish. And, and government in some ways, if you think about the road of employment, economic success, which is going over these people's heads, governments have to create the on-ramp for people to get on the road. And that's it. I think government lets to then let, let people do what they gotta do. So I'm, I'm sort of uh, particularly wary of any government program or anything where government sort of participates uh, gets to the point of actually doing this stuff because then what happens is it becomes restrictive. And so I, I believe as an entrepreneur, I believe in the power of entrepreneurship. I believe in creating employment that gives people sort of uh, economic freedom. And uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Peter Bauer, who's an economist who once said, a true development means expansion of one's individual choice. And occupational mobility, malnourishment, poor education, all this stuff are sort of restrict economic cho uh, individual choice. And my, my submission to the government would be that you try to help people you know, you know, do all this to help people to get up, but beyond that, you know, sort of let them, let markets dictate what needs to happen, let, let sort of entrepreneurship thrive. So that'll be my submission. Thank you. This is a very rich fault line which we need to explore with all of you as well. Um, government must stay out, government must enable and build partnerships with the private sector. Uh, let's move forward now with uh, Ellen, your view of where uh, entrepreneurship can be generated given this kind of uh, landscape we've had described to us already. Yeah, it's clear that um, sustainable livelihood is the issue for rural areas, and so how do we get there? And just take a look at the history of what happened in the service industry in this country, where great entrepreneurship uh, created tremendous amount of jobs, tremendous amount of livelihood, um, a tremendous amount of GDP. You look at that in the last decade, it's occurred in the manufacturing area as well. But in the agricultural area, not much has transformed since the Green Revolution of some 40 to 50 years ago. And so it is about getting subsistence farmers to income generating farmers. It, when they're at the subsistence level, they cannot afford to educate their kids. They cannot afford health care. They can't afford to make any investments in their own farm in order to be able to bring themselves above that. So how do you raise that level of subsistence to income generating farm? Well, there are several ways. One of them is technology. Uh, India's lagged in technology from an agricultural standpoint. There are many things out there. They're hybrids. They're not that controversial. But still, there's large swaths of farmland where open pollinization does exist and they haven't moved to hybrids. Secondly is new technologies like biotechnology or genetic modification. It's a little more controversial, but nonetheless adds tremendously to the productivity of the farmer. So we need to get on with understanding the science, creating the frameworks that allow India through public-private partnerships to make decisions about genetic modification. We need to open up and more research plots to get the data locally uh, on understanding how it, how it um, thrives in this environment, you know, to create that productivity. India's got great soil. It's very fertile. And so that's not the issue. The issue is gaining not only the technology from a seed or input standpoint, it's also about business models. Um, agronomy is a wonderful thing. Soil testing locally to understand, no, they do or do not need that fertilizer or that nitrate to be able to get the most out of the crop. You know, we've been partnering locally um, we, uh, with NGOs, Uday is one of them, where we're aggregating farmers so that they can buy their inputs at a much lower cost. 50, 60 farmers, their volumes are larger, their inputs are lower, their incomes are higher. 
You know, and that's just one step. So it takes technology, it takes uh, partnerships between the government, between private industry and NGOs to really work locally on sustainable solutions, things like Uday, things like farm entrepreneurs, um, who not only are working their farm, but are actually sales agents for companies on inputs, connecting the farmers out to the marketplace, the infrastructure, the cold chain needs work. But nonetheless, for the most part, we need to make those connections from a market access standpoint. So it's going to take more than just technology. It's going to take new business models and partnerships, but we have to get on with it. The debate can't be whether you know, something is good or bad. It's got to be tried. It's got to be tested. It's got to understand the value of it for the farmer, because at the end of the day, if it's not raising his income, it's not going to catch on. It's not going to create the kind of sustainable livelihoods that we need. Ellen, you're talking there very much about farmers. Can I just press you? It is about rural entrepreneurship, which goes beyond the farmer himself. It is beyond the farm. The farm is one. There's a lot of support services that farms require in order to be productive. Yeah. Um, it is the support services around um, you know, soil testing, around there's weather insurance. I mean, there's a lot of different other aspects of the infrastructure required to get agricultural productivity. Suram, did you want to just yeah, come in on this point? No, I, think, I think she's right, because I think China tried this model. I think call it, they call it uh, town and village enterprises, where they, made, where they got farmers to sort of aggregate, get economies of scale. And then the people who were not sort of working in agriculture uh, directly started working in ancillary services. And that created huge amounts of employment, right? And then that created the service industry that then sort of propelled their growth. And I sort of agree that uh, India has to follow that. And of course, lots of regulations need to happen. I mean, land reform needs to happen. Aggregation of land needs to happen. I mean, we've got a lot of things to do. And government needs to spend time doing all that. And I think we're sort of not spending time doing that. And that's kind of why we're not able to get the economies of scale, uh, which is kind of, which is to your point, so. Elizabeth, uh, your thoughts about rural entrepreneurship, not just farming. Yeah, um, we're very focused in, in the health and energy space. Getting it right in India is so important to us. We've actually set up India as a standalone company run by John Flannery, who's, who's here. And um, GE is going to be watching what happens in the rural space in India so that we can replicate it in Brazil, in China, in Africa. And I think what we're finding is you have to debunk a couple of myths, especially as a high-tech company. The first myth that has to be gotten rid of is this sense that uh, you sacrifice quality or technology when you, when you go after cost. And it couldn't be, farther, couldn't be farther from the truth. For us, it's really about taking the highest technology and targeting it to the right need at the right time. Um, and we've got this mantra around the company. We're starting to talk about more products at more price points. And uh, for technologists, it's, it has to be an understanding that we're, we're innovating for a, what's been called the value segment, which is actually a valuable segment. The reality is if you, if you innovate for cost, a lot of amazing things happen. A couple of examples for us um, in the area of maternal and infant care, looking at uh, incubators for, for babies in hospitals. Uh, one that might have cost $20,000 in a developed space can't, can't be that way in a rural space. Maybe not even $7,000 uh, would, would be an appropriate place where, where we're starting, but looking at battery backup. How do you really start to understand what the needs are? Uh, warming lights. Uh, have, we've been able to take the cost from $1,100 down to 200, and they're working to get it even lower so that it can it can work in rural and uh, rural hospitals. Um, they're looking a lot at outsourcing costs. I think I really underestimated the value that having cost as a target can do to in, to innovation. Um, our folks in healthcare have taken, there's an ECG, we call it the MacEye. It's a portable ECG machine. And basically they've said, how do we use other sources of innovation so that we don't have to do it? Uh, electricity supply. They've even looked around and said, hey, let's use a printer in the, um, car in the uh, electrocardiogram. Let's use a printer that's similar to the one used in rail stations putting out tickets. Something that uh, we don't have to innovate, we can, we can outsource to, to others. Um, so getting technology right and realizing you're not sacrificing it for cost is, is big. The second piece, especially when you're in a technology company, is, um, is really understanding that technology isn't the only answer. You need market-backed solutions, and that's where I spend a lot of my time and, and the teams I work with, really looking at what are those behaviors, what are the market needs that drive the technology. Um, if you're a technology company, you can sort of fall in love with your technology and want to put all the features into it. Um, a, a couple of examples. Um, 
Um, we're, we're trying to get sort of customer and market insights way up in the product development cycle and a couple of, uh, of examples uh, to, to give you. Um, one is uh, looking at agriculture. I do have an example in agriculture. Um, the, the reality is um, you need power generation in a lot of decentralized places. Well, we have a, an energy, an engine that can burn bio waste. So you start to look around and you say, hey, farmers have a lot of bio waste. Um, there is a lot of uh, need in, in local communities with bio waste. So suddenly you start to set up um, interesting kinds of, uh, of, of situations. Um, I think the, one of the biggest issues in rural situations is, especially in healthcare, you don't have the quality or the number of technicians. Forget general practitioner doctors. You don't even have the technicians who, who can use the equipment. So you have to understand the behaviors. Uh, for example, with that lullaby baby warmer, uh, in a developed space, in a, in a, in a more um, urban setting, you might move the baby from place to place to place and find it's OK. In a rural setting, you can't move the baby. So you have to be able to bring, things, bring other pieces to the baby. So you have to set it up that it works in the workflow, that you can tilt and, and move the baby in different directions. Um, you have to be able to have this one, two button simplicity. The uh, electrocardiogram I, I spoke of, it has required us to ha literally have two buttons, on, off. And it's designed as a screening mechanism to then get someone uh, who has an issue to more, more serious treatment. So, so you, you start to understand that. And I, I guess I can't uh, emphasize enough simplicity as a, as a product, simplicity as a virtue, um, when you don't have the kind of technical uh, assistance. Uh, it creates business models, new opportunities for midwives and other people uh, who can start to create services from, from this kind of screening equipment. And then finally, I think that um, you can't just look at a product on its own. Just one technology, one product isn't going to solve the answer. It's about a system. So like some of the other folks here, I think private, public-private partnerships are key. We've got several of them going on in the healthcare space. Um, in a number of states uh, throughout India, Gujarat, uh, Antia, Pradesh, and a few others where we're working with this, the state government they're setting up training centers, and we're bringing know-how, expertise, training for nurses, for nurse practitioners. And again, that creates new opportunities for, uh, for employment. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, ben, uh, try and bring this all together, the connectivity. We're now moving in for, into infrastructure as well. So um, let me first um, look to the problem in, in a macro sense. And here is maybe a, a strange comment, but I think it's truly true. The size of the problem is so big that it can't be a problem, it has to be an opportunity. If you talk about 700 million people, in itself that is such a huge market. To tap into that market should be the driving force. And a lot of the discussion over the last 20 years has been basically, is this a social, ethical problem or is it an economic problem? And we have tried basically both sides. We have tried in the beginning very much to make it into a, a guilt trip. How can we have a country that has these problems? And I fully understand that. But I think it's time to look at it in a very, different a very different manner. Look to India and look to the journey that India took. You could say 20 years ago, the whole of India had the same connotation. If you would talk about India, you would talk about poverty and elephants. Now you talk about a world power right in the middle of what's happening in the world, and that is changed in a, in a remarkable short period of time. So why wouldn't we approach the same 700 million with the same attitude? And if you look to what worked for India, it's based on talented people and connectivity with the markets they serve. As long as you take it into the, into the connotation as a social problem, it will take 100 years to get there. So you have to change the focus that you bring to it. Let me give you one other number. 15 years ago, the penetration of voice telephony in this country was 1%. Today, it's 70%. And the main uh, gains have been made in the last five years. The penetration of internet today is 1%. So why wouldn't that go in the same way, but then a little bit faster? And I think. Everything is there. So when I heard um, you talk about a public-private partnership, I thought, wow, that's good. But then you said one sentence. You said Indian companies. No. You said Indian companies. 
I if said you would open companies. up, if you would open up to the world, I think you will find a much different agenda than if it's just Indian companies. Arvind, do you want to just clarify what Ben has yeah, said? I'd uh, like to clarify one. I, did, I said Indian companies have, uh, you know, responded to our expression of interest. But, but, uh, but no, you, other, did you ask the no world? other company did. So, see, did you ask the world? We don't have to ask in the sense. We have a very clear foreign investment policy. And in the infrastructure side, barring one or two strategic areas of infrastructure, there is no bar in foreign companies investing. So the question no, no. is, there is no, we are not debarring anybody from doing that. There's a international competitive bid process. Mm. And in that bid, whichever company would uh, respond to it would be considered. So I did not say that we are debarring foreign right. companies from coming in. Okay. All I said was that for the pilots, when we did the expression of interest, very large Indian companies responded to that. So ben, the floor is yours again. Finish your thoughts. So, what I think we should do is we should look to this problem in an opportunity sense. Here are 700 million. Where do we find in the world a market of 700 million people? It is simply to tap into the market. Knowledge and connectivity has been the driving force from bringing India from low on the list to very high on the list of global powers. We need India. We need India in the world. We need a market of 1.2 billion people. And I think the approach that we need to take is an opportunistic approach. Can you just clarify us with the latest thinking in the, in the, in the telecom field about the correlation between connectivity and generating uh, wealth even in the most rural of areas. What kind of evidence is there? I know you're going to tell us that it's a, a tremendous multiplier, but how clear is that evidence now? So let me give you two examples. Number one, illiteracy. It takes somebody to go to classroom six years to learn to read and to write in a, in a, in a certain level. Give that person something in the palm of their hands to work with, and that period goes down to less than a year. Because they do it in an intuitive sense. They connect to connect to others. They get information that they really want to have. And the evidence is that the period in which people learn to read and to write goes down dramatically. Second, look to Africa. You give capabilities to have information. You cut out the middleman and the position, the bargaining position of the farmer towards the end market goes up incredibly. So these are just two random examples. If it's true that in 2012 every single village is connected to broadband, it's new news to me. But if it's true that it's happened in 2012, that should be the basis of a revolution. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I just be clear? But Entre does it generate entrepreneurship? Are we asking the right question here about entrepreneurship when it comes to your business on connectivity? Uh, uh, Let me answer that question. It does. In <laughs> fact, if you look at the Common Service Center scheme, uh, which has been rolled out by the Department of Information Technology, where villages up, up to 6,000 population get one common service center, the entire concept, again, on public-private partnership is to create village-level entrepreneurship, which is built around digital connectivity and services which are available over the internet. Uh, some examples that I have seen, for instance, in the state of Bihar, there are villages where now these village-level entrepreneurs are selling railway tickets of the value of a lakh and a half crores, 150,000 crore rupees, uh, uh, lakh rupees and, uh, or more where no railway reservations were ever done earlier because through the common uh, service centers these people are able to sell these tickets and charge 10 rupees 15 rupees 20 rupees per transaction and it's a very robust model they're earning about 25 to 30 thousand rupees a month only through these common service centers which he's speaking about so that this is already happening and as the uh, the uh, broadband connectivity takes place uh, by March of 2012, that's what the Department of uh, Information uh, of, uh, of Telecommunication tell us. In, in which case, common service centers would be available in every village of 6,000 population or more. So, in which case, a huge uh, number of people would get involved in this. I would also like to mention another initiative, which again will create uh, 
uh, entrepreneurship at the lowest level, which is uh, what we are now moving is on the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme that is running throughout the country. Biometric ICT enabled transactions at the work site level, which will be real time in nature as the connectivity comes in. And this also is through public private partnerships. So again, in every village, you will have people who are in the private sector with handheld devices providing services for a scheme which is run by the government. So a uh, large number but, of these but, but I'm still very happening. surprised. This country has rules that says, for example, that you can't share spectrum between operators. I have no idea how you go to all the villages uh, and bring them broadband connectivity if the basic assumption there is are that you have the same rules uh, of not sharing that you have in the cities and going to rural areas. There is simply no business model. There is no financial business model unless you take some very drastic steps in, in, in government policies around the capability to bring this connectivity to the people. So I'm very surprised to hear this. Uh, well, I am very surprised to hear what you're saying because, <laughs> <laughs> because well, once again check, we are check. It's true. No, that's why I'm saying. But it's a again. clear it's a clear business perception that uh, an enormous organisation like Ben's has. Possibly based not on full disclosure of information. Well, to I them, can tell you that that could be a problem. Because, that because I, I, I can only is not say allowed. This. No, one moment. I am not even going into that space because that is not a space I look at. All I'm saying is that if there is a spectrum available to one service provider, then all these private entrepreneurs will buy spec you know, space from that service provider. So I don't see this being a well, problem in creating entrepreneurship well, at the ground level. Sorry. One moment. Today, if in some areas the telecom service is available only through, say, BSNL, one service provider, I, as far as I'm concerned, I get a telephone connection through BSNL. I'm concerned with the telephone connection. Now, if this is a problem with business business uh, level people who would want to compete in that area, I'm not looking at that at this point of time. The issue we are discussing now is village level entrepreneurship. None of those people at the village level are going to compete for Spectrum with Reliance or with Airtel or Sorry. with the, anyone else. Sorry. They will buy that service from whoever is providing that service in the village. And all I'm saying is, at least one of those service providers will sell that service at the village for the village entrepreneurs to buy that and use it for their own business model. We That's mustn't all. get stuck on spectrum, but uh, as you know, well, very so it, it is a can, can I just make point. a point, Ben? As you know, there is a particular issue over spectrum, which has caused a political I, casualty I know, in the last I know, 24 hours. I know, I know, I'm, I'm fully aware of it, but with all due respect, uh, I, I think that uh, the government should look a little bit deeper into the problem there are no business models, not for a single person to go to all the rural areas with Spectrum, unless you bundle. There is no way that from a financial point of view you can bring the services, you know, internet penetration of 1%. You need to give those people access to the information that they require to develop their, their, their area. I'm not talking about competition. I'm way ahead for, uh, for, from that. It is simply not true that there are business models in place to go to all the places. Let's ask Mr. Bhatt, who runs the largest banking services in this country and possibly in Asia, that they have business correspondents working in large number of villages already who are operating their processes through internet in the villages. It is happening today as of now at this moment. Just before he answers, though, can I just ask you, do you accept that you need to talk a little bit more to the other ministries about this issue if there's going to be connectivity? See, for me, as far as I'm concerned, for instance, on ICT biometric real-time transaction at work site at Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme and the village level, I am at the moment in the process of, again, through international competitive bidding, <laughs> finding pi private partners to work with me I am halfway through that process and I have very large number of private companies who are working with me. We, in 18 months, we want to roll it out in every village in the country and not one of them has said this is a problem. Okay. Now, I am working with them on the ground. Okay, no, you know, no, I agree with him that it could be a problem for companies who want to do business or want to drive down prices vis a vis spectrum. But as far as the end user in these rural areas is concerned, and as far as those institutions who are engaged in providing these facilities in rural areas is concerned, I think this is not an issue. Just uh, to add, we have about 27,000 customer service points across 
village, unbanked villages in this country, uh, business correspondent and business facilitator model. We have them having uh, point of sale, term they, they work on point on sale uh, terminals, they work on cell phones, a cell phone is a bank, they work on internet kiosks, these are the various technologies on which they are working on. And uh, even outside this, for example, fishermen in Kerala, they use cell phones to find out what is the price of fish before they land, and therefore it has brought down the cost of fish to the consumer, it has increased their profits and it has driven the middleman away. In State Bank of India, we have tied up with Reuters. Uh, for the help, uh, for the use of farmers. What farmers can do is that on a cell phone, they can get information on weather, they can get information on farm produce prices, they can get information on what fertilizers to use, what insecticides to use, they can get information on almost anything at uh, something as low as something like five rupees a month. Now, this has been done with the help of Reuters. So, even in State Bank of India, we have today on our network 46 million transactions a day, each transaction getting completed in microseconds. So whether it is spectrum, whether it is connectivity of this kind, I think that is not coming in the way of uh, outreach. What is coming in the way of outreach is, you know, other enablers which we don't have at the moment. But, but let me just pick up on uh, Ben's point that still there's not enough um, connectivity uh, within the government in order to make this spectrum available. He's talking about uh, coming in from the outside as a new opportunity, a great opportunity, but essentially indicating there's still political constraint on this. Is that your perception from the bank? Well, whether it is the government or whether it, this is any other institution, the, the, the connectivity as you use it, or I would say, you know, uh, uh, more interaction and more exchange of information would always be beneficial. There is no doubt about it. It will clear away some of the cobwebs, uh, misunderstanding, misinformation, make things move faster. I mean, that is a generic statement to which I agree, and it is there in several areas, not only in the area of spectrum. Uh, but the point that Mr. Mayaram and I are trying to make is that this is talking about innovation and entrepreneurship for the poorest of the poor. We are talking about outreach to India's unconnected villages. And what we are saying is that so far, spectrum has not been found to be an issue because there is Airtel, there is BSNL, there is Vodafone. I mean, there may be only one service provider, but as long as he provides, it doesn't matter to State Bank of India. It doesn't matter to State Bank of India's customer. But do you agree with Ben, who's putting, putting it on the table very clearly, the size of the problem is so big that there is a massive, big opportunity now I in the rural agree, areas? I couldn't agree more with him. I mean, I, am, I, I totally agree with him. This is that uh, Prahlad's theory about the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid. Huge fortune, huge opportunity. I agree with him totally. So how do we exploit that? Uh, what's your view, uh, Sir M? So I agree with Mr. Mayaram that government is in the right business. And I, and I, when I sort of take exception that connectivity isn't there in lots of places. We work in rural areas, and there are lots of places that are connected today. And when I mean by connectivity, it may not be the kind of connectivity you expect it to happen. So maybe that's the sort of technical difference we're talking about. But uh, to Mr. Bo See, Bud's we are not saying that there is 100% connectivity. No, but in this country, there are more than 700 million who've got cell phones. There are more Correct. people in this country who have cell phones than they have bank accounts. And right? toilets. There are, we know that. So that's that's absolutely no, no, no question about it. I mean, there are more to more cell phones than toilets. So we need We're to do more. We need to do more. But even where there is connectivity, there is not enough financial inclusion. Even where there is connectivity, right. there is not enough economic opportunity. Even where there is connectivity, there is a huge opportunity, as Ben is saying, absolutely. which has not been fully exploited for the benefit of the people. So there is a lot of work to be done. I, I'm on, I'm on with you. I'm totally with you on that. And I want you, the only point I want to make here is that with connectivity, you have to allow entrepreneurship to breed. I mean, we are giving India such a short window right now to make a judgment on India. I think that's pretty unfair. I agree, with, you know, we've, just, we've just opened this. Now he said kiosks and lots of other opportunities, banking correspondence, they're all just coming up. And I think we've got to be a little patient with India. And the reason I bring it up is because the information asymmetry between the people in rural areas and like lots of people like us is pretty high. And if you've got to give some time for these opportunities to burgeon, but my guess is entrepreneurship will thrive in these areas. They will use connectivity. And I think to his point about BEAT and NRGS, BEATS, bank correspondence, all these things are just the beginning. And I think people will use it in education, in healthcare. I'm sure she'll have points to say about that, in agriculture, in pricing, all these kind of things. So I'm, I'm, my only limited point to you, Ben, is I think entrepreneurship will find a way to use this new form of access to improve the lives of the poor in rural areas. And I just think we have to be patient to get there. Governments shouldn't play a role. Governments are not playing a role in this space, which is a great thing. They're letting access come there, and to his point, almost all people now in rural areas 
of getting to an ac to access uh, through a mobile phone. And that's sort of an internet as we know it today need not be through a computer. It could be through a mobile phone. And I just, just think <coughs> we'll get there. Let's broaden Simple. this because you did lay on the table, as Ben's just done on a big opportunity, quote, government must stay out. Let's talk about this fault line. Um, Ellen and Elizabeth, what's your experience as major corporates playing in this market or investing in this market about the role the government here in India should or should not play or is playing? Well, you know, government has an absolute... In the rural um, areas. Yeah, a government absolutely has a critical role. The local governments in terms of support um, of programs that are going out there, in terms of access and, and connectivity, as they said, that connectivity that farmers or other locals need to banking, to, um, uh, you know, markets, you know, we take that for granted in manufacturing. Yeah. We take that for granted in the service industries. The rural community needs that same connectedness to value chain. And the local governments, you know, I believe, at least in our experience and working through the agricultural community, are critical in understanding where the issues are, where the opportunities are, how you can aggregate. Federal government as well, in terms of the regulatory environment and regimes to get new technologies approved, um, they have to work hand in hand. And it's not one or the other, it's both. I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't mean government. Can I just hear Elizabeth's point of view? Yeah, I, uh, I, th I agree with Ellen. I, uh, I also think from a health, just to take health care as an example, uh, local government needs help from a multinational company that can quickly come in and give it the kind of expertise, the training. Uh, you know, where do you start? One of the biggest issues that any local government has, really anywhere in the world, but certainly in India, is the health and wellness of my of my community. And so, uh, when you're when you're in a government, you can reach out to a bigger company, I think, and get what you need quickly. For a bigger company, a multinational like ours, a high tech company, we have to stop and say the solution isn't always just technology. Uh, it may be consulting. It may be different kinds of services and different business models um, are, are what you need to offer. And so I, I think you do need that. You need the federal government to create the right kind of uh, regulation and incentives. But um, it, it can work that way. And in fact, I think really great models of companies and local governments coming together, especially in these critical services like healthcare and energy. Sir, um, isn't it a bit too bold to say government must stay out? Yeah, so I, uh, let me sort of give me an opportunity to rephrase that. I meant government should you enable, I, I agree, government should enable businesses, and I'm saying government shouldn't be in the business, and these are two different things, and I think it's, it's subtle, but it's important, because, and I agree with her, I mean, you have to uh, provide environments for agriculture, for land reform, lots of stuff in the agriculture sector. These are all enabling environments, which is what the government should do, but government shouldn't be in the business of doing this. For example, agri, uh, uh, you know, buying, uh, you know, markets, right, when, when farmers produce all this stuff, government is now a big procurer of these things. You know, let markets, free markets play. Let's sort of let people have open exchanges, buying and selling commodities, and my only limited point is that be an enabling environment, just don't be in the business of doing it. And that's all, that's, that's my, that's let my me, point. Let me just say one uh, could I, could I just start? If anyone else wants to join this discussion, there are microphones around, please. I can see a hand there and a hand here and a hand here. But don't let me stop you. I just want to make sure uh, the microphones are lined very, up. Very quickly, I want to place something on record here, which is, you know, in the rural areas, which is, which is quite uncharted and which is uh, very complex for several reasons, there is a need for risk sharing between the government and the private sector. I do not believe that the private sector would have appetite for taking on the entire risk by saying governments should stay out of it, yeah. especially in critical areas. And therefore, a good, robust model of public-private partnership where risks are apportioned in accordance with who is best in being able to take them and then risk mitigating uh, factors are put into that design, that will work the best. Well, can I just sound that out with those representing business here, Ben, risk sharing between the government and the private sector, given the enormity of the challenge out there in the rural sector here? I totally agree, because this is not one size fits all. I, I think what, what, what is trying to be said is, give space for enter entrepreneurial behavior. But there are certain sectors like education, that it is unthinkable yeah. that you can have government on the side. There is a massive role for government to play, but it is a, a role that has to give enough space for very local, very entrepreneurial behavior. And let's not forget that India has, has, India has developed itself by entrepreneurial heroes. But the word is innovation here. Is that kind of relationship going to innovate in the way that's needed because yeah. of the scale you've talked about? So innovation is not just technology. 
innovation is much more about using the human capabilities in a very different way than we've seen so far. It is out of the question that rural India can copy what happens in the urban side. But that doesn't mean that there is not a huge potential there to develop its own way to go and make economic wealth a reality. Yeah, Ellen, uh, the, the principle of risk sharing between government and private sector. Well, I think it differs greatly by sector. Um, I do think it differs greatly by sector. So um, in agricultural, it's different than healthcare, is different than education, is different than in the services industry. And I think each one has to bring its unique model to bear. And that's where that conversation, that's where that integration on these private pu public partnerships become important in understanding what is the role of the government, what is the role of private industry, and how do they go forward. They are an enabler. I absolutely agree that they can be a great enabler or disabler and it's up to us to enter into that conversation. Elizabeth. Yeah, the very nature of a partnership means sharing risk. I mean, that's what partners do. They share strengths and capabilities, and they share risk. Um, it really is about creating an enabling system. And I think if you look at something like healthcare, you need government to at least start the acceleration, to be a catalyst, to say there are certain screenings that have to happen for people to be in better health. That needs to, a company can't start that on their own. They need to team with government. But at some point, the government has to step back and say, these are these systems, we're going to let the entrepreneurs take over. OP Bud, do you see a mindset changing on this, of risk sharing between government and the private sector when it comes to innovating rural entrepreneurship? Yes, not only I see it changing, you know, I want to put it slightly differently. What is required for all these things to come up is not just one thing. We require infrastructure, rural and otherwise. We require technology. We require marketing connections. We require outreach. There are so many things which are required, which can be brought about only by the government collectively. And one impinges on the other. So what is required is also a kind of leadership or direction, uh, which is there in many places in India, which is there in not all the places in India. And if I may give an example of the state of Bihar, which is recent in the news, uh, because of the kind of leadership that has been provided there, Bihar till last year was the fastest growing state in the country. And if it continues to be like that, one of the poorest, one of the most backward, but if you look at it in terms of law and order, which is an important enabler of innovation, enterprise, and growth. If you look at it in terms of infrastructure, particularly the roads infrastructure, if you look at it in terms of uh, services like education and, and, and IT connectivity, Bihar is growing at about 13%. You know, India is growing at 8.8, .8, Bihar is growing at 13%. Which country in the world is going at 13%? But that has come about only as a result of leadership and the direction that the leadership has provided. So it all connects with ability to take risk and everything else. Right, a maximum of a minute each, whoever gets the microphone, innovating rural entrepreneurship. You have the microphone first and then over there. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. My first question goes out to Mr. Mayaram. Uh, we've seen a lot of ideas over here on public-private partnerships happening, et cetera, et cetera, which would happen. What's the timeline that we are looking at? I understand that the bill will be signed middle of January 2011, but by the time the impact starts, what is our aim? You know, what's the kind of number that we're trying to reach you know, on a five-year span or a 10-year span? My second question goes to, uh, it's, a, it's an opinion which could be discussed. What about rural tourism? I was reading an article in the New York Times which spoke about how the urban people in US really venture out to the uh, suburbs and you know, the farmlands to take a breathe of the natural beauty and et cetera, eating organic fruits, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, oh, can we see something like this All right. in India as well? Lovely, okay. First of all, Mr. Myram, that specific question on the timeline. Uh, for different initiatives, there are different timeline. As I mentioned, for the Pura provisioning of urban amenities in rural areas, we will be signing the concession agreement by the middle of uh, January. Uh, the construction period is three years, and then 10 years is the maintenance period. But we do believe that uh, within one year, we would know exactly how it is happening. Because if the private sector is completely plugged in and the construction phase is in, in accordance with the plan, then we do believe there is, a, there is a case for scaling that up. We will come to that as we learn from that. Uh, the biometric ICT enabled uh, public-private partnership under the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee uh, Scheme will be rolled out in 18 months from March of next year. So we are in the process of completing the process of identifying the partners. So there are different timelines for these. On rural tourism, let me tell you this something interesting. Out of the 13 Pura projects that we have received from the private parties, 
four of them have said the economic activity which they will start in their area of uh, identified area is uh, rural tourism. So there is a lot of emphasis coming under rural tourism. In fact, the government of India, finance ministry and the Asian Development Bank have now pushed the rural tourism idea into the sovereign lending part of it also. For instance, Uttarak, <coughs> this, uh, Punjab and Himachal Pradesh have already now gotten into contracting a loan from the Asian Development Bank for developing rural infrastructure for rural tourism. So much of it is already happening. On the ground. But the, the, the absolute numbers are going to be quite small, aren't they? We're talking about with tourism. The pilots are going to be, the, uh, for, as far as <laughs> biometric ICT driven is concerned, the entire country will be covered, which is all uh, the uh, 250,000 panchayats. So the entire country. So that number is not small. It is saturation. Okay. Right. Let's keep remarks short, please, because a lot of people want to speak. My name is Ram Chandra Gallup, Chairman of Amaraja Group of Companies. We have been involved in a rural development through the industry and also with the trust. In the trust, we are focusing on the education, health, and skill development. And Mr. Mayanabad, one of the things most of the time government guidelines is coming is running around various different organizations. The clear guidelines, the missing when we approach it. Is there something one department can coordinate in one place in a single window like thing? We will be able to approach and get the support what is needed. Number two, public-private participation. Is there something private-private industries together? You can support the like trust activities when you are involved in rural development. There is another thing can be explored, and is there something can be done? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, the uh, problem of uh, one department is uh, <coughs> is that. If you're doing education, obviously health ministry will not be able to help you. If you're doing health, then education will not be able to help you. So as far as your indiv individual activities is concerned, you'll have to deal with different ministries or departments. We, we are, uh, when I was talking of this uh, pri public-private partnership from this particular forum, I am not speaking of uh, the s corporate social responsibility kind of activities or philanthropic activities mm. through trusts. That's a completely different area. It is very important area. I'm not saying it's not important. But today, I'm not speaking of that. I'm talking of a commercial relationship between government and private sector, which is dependent on returns on the investment. So it is scalable. Sure, Ram, do you want to add anything yeah, on that? OK. <laughs> Who's got the, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here, please. Uh, Sanjeev Chadha, PepsiCo. Uh, we've heard a lot from the panel about technology connectivity. What I'd like to hear more about is other critical areas uh, to rural development. Infrastructure, especially education, capability and skill building. Yeah. Are we innovating enough there? Who would like to come in on that? Capability and scalability of education. Skill. skill. Well, in addition to whatever, education is a state subject, so states are doing whatever they have to do, but we know that this is not enough. What has happened of late is that the banking industry and by this I mean the public sector banks, in each district, they are setting up a training uh, institution or whatever you call it by the name of Root City. And this institution is designed to help the people that we are talking about, that is literate, uh, semi-literate or illiterate, people who are looking for livelihood, people who are looking for increasing whatever incomes they have, to give them some basic training in, in accountancy, in entrepreneurship, in uh, some of the skills which may be required in that particular area. So it could be running a small, say, flour mill, it could be running a beautician shop or whatever it is. And in the case of State Bank of India, the, our experience is that nearly 40% of these people who participate in these training programs, and these training programs are just for about a week or so. For some, it could be more intensive, but broadly it's about just one week. About 40% of them take loans from our bank to set up some of the activities in which they have been trained in. So this is one effort that the banking industry is doing. The other thing that we are now going to do, and it may be launched maybe sometime in January, is, a, is an all India mass awareness campaign about the desirability of financial inclusion and the benefits that can flow therefrom for economic inclusion and economic growth. So that campaign is sort of work in progress. It will be a multimedia campaign. It will also be feet on the street or other feet on the villages. So vans and you know campaigners, multimedia, television, video, people, puppets, 
some kind of street plays, etc., would fan out across the country to, uh, to create awareness on this. So these two prongs are being done by the Indian banking industry. Ellen. Yeah, just quickly, you know, we find in rural communities there are natural leaders. And if we can access them and get the training to them around modern agronomy, and around how to test soil for inputs. They become real um, purveyors of that education out to the small farmers across their communities. And so it is that trickle down. You can find one influencer in a community and, and as we go in and access that and then we train them, it has this uh, you know, effect to really have a much broader impact on that. And it's those types of, types of very simple things that are gonna really move the needle. Ben, your frustration when you hear that kind of question, knowing the bandwidth, and connectivity issues and the, the enormous potential there is uh, to uh, solve or begin to resolve the education challenge in the rural areas? Well, frustration is a very bad uh, advisor, so I don't, I, I, I'm not sticking to frustration. I, I think one of the things that we, we, we see here very, very clearly is that education starts with the teacher. And the teacher can be remote, the teacher can be on the ground. It has to be more than uh, um, basic education has to be skills led and I think that there is an enormous opportunity here to use all means not just one but all means in, in we, we talk a lot about black and white here and that's why we have a forum but the reality of course it's a mixture uh, let me just uh, point to you uh, two websites because of paucity of time one is of National Skill Development Corporation which has been set up uh, again a public-private partnership between government and private sector and the rural development ministry's website where we have a huge program for national rural livelihood mission but that's all right if if you're connected if you're not connected it's no use uh, i had already mentioned that the problem of connectivity is perceived differently from different okay. angles all so right. as far as we are concerned we are connected <laughs> <laughs> all right well, well, I, well and we are connected and that's why i'm asking you to look at the website those in the country, though, can't necessarily see it because they can't get connected, which is Ben's point earlier. Uh, but I'm not going to re re revisit Spectrum at the moment, please. My name is Raghu. I'm from Infosys. Uh, the question is to Mr. Mayaram. There are many layers of government, the central, the state, and the local. And typically, good-meaning intentions fall by <coughs> somewhere on the wayside, you know, some, some through the cracks. Uh, let me give you the situation and then you can give me an answer. We set up a 100 people BPO in one of the states which I shall not name. Uh, the government was supposed to take 50% of the seats through outsourcing some of the local government activities. But unfortunately, the local government at the third level did not play ball. Fortunately for me, though this was from a trust which I have in interest and which has a public-private partnership, by the way, it has very senior ex-chief secretaries. Uh, 40 or 50 is a small number for Infosys, and we just went on the private sector route. We told the government, if your local government doesn't play ball, that's okay. But then if you want to do, if you do want to scale it up, Mr. Mayaram, shouldn't you look at a framework by which well-meaning intentions at the national capital, be it in terms of things like local government playing ball or giving the facilities that are required, do really happen on the ground? Are this you know, or this will just be something on the paper. Do really happen on the ground, do you yes. accept? Uh, one, I'm not holding brief for all governmental activities here. <laughs> so, as you would not hold brief for all private sector activities also. So I guess we need to understand that there is asymmetry. I mean, there'll be different, there will be problems. What I'm talking about is a relationship which is based on a contract where you can take me to the court of law and get your and get it adjudicated. This is how you would deal in a contract with a private sector party. Suppose a you were into a contract with private sector party which reneged on its contract, what would you do? You'll take him for a specific performance of the contract. I'm saying enter into a same relationship with me, take me to the court if I don't behave. I think that's a fair enough proposition. Sir Ram. Most of the lawsuits in India are against the government, so that's... Uh, Could you keep the microphone in front of you? I said most of the lawsuits in India are against the government, so that's a... But the point that you made on decentralization, I think that's extremely important. And, and, I'm, and I agree with Mr. Mayaram, the governments in Delhi can't sort of really make this work. You know, we have a panchayati raj system that has huge power that's delegated to the last mile. And, you know, our experience has been 
which I think will be useful for you to think about, would be for you to find a way to work with these, with these people at the local level. You really can't expect a fatwa from the top saying, you know, get this done. Because if that was the case, then all government programs have been delivered on time. You know, just these things don't happen. Last mile problems exist. And the important thing for us to understand is that these, each of them behave as individual sort of government entities and you have to find a way to work with them. Just before we go to one last question, because we're almost out of time, can I give you advance notice? I'd like you to think uh, 12 months from now, 24 months from now, if we have the same session and you're on the panel, can you imagine that there will be significant progress being reported on innovation in rural entrepreneurship towards employment, or are we going to be having the same discussions about the same issues with no progress or little progress, please? I'm Prakash Hinduja from the Hinduja Group of Companies. I would very much like to put a question to Mr. Bhatt and to the panel over here, that this rural entrepreneurship is the different world itself. We should have a separate bank focusing on the rural entrepreneurship program. If we really want to achieve and go through it in a big way, there's a huge population, 500 million are around this place. And this will be of a great accomplishment after the panel we should have in the private sector and the public sector, the industrialists who are CII is the largest heading the industrialist zone over here. They should make a commitment and make a plan that everybody should have a plan in that particular sector in state where they are to see that how they can bring in entrepreneurship right. and try to help around that area in the, every sector of the place. Thank you. Mr. Bart, he didn't actually say this, but what he's saying is that your bank doesn't actually serve the rural community as well as banks should, given the scale of what is needed. Would you like to have a subsidiary or to br have a breakaway bank which could provide that kind of service? Do you no, accept the criticism? No. no, no, no. I accept the criticism that maybe we can do more. Maybe all of us should do more. But I would also like to make a statement, which I said earlier, that we are the institution which is doing the most in this country. Most is not good enough, that point I take. But as regards having a subsidiary, you know, by its very definition, we are talking about places which have got low population density. We are talking about places which are difficult to access. We are talking about places where there is low critical mass of economic activity. We are talking about a huge amount of disbursement. And then innovation and entrepreneurial it is itself not about centralization, but about you know millions of people at millions of places doing millions of different things. So if you were to have one institution, one centralized institution, it, I don't think we would get it right. But if every institution, both banks and non-banks, governments and private sector, if all of us were to do that little bit more, then I think we would get it right. So that's my Elizabeth. Favorite. I think you're going to see more of that from companies. Uh, in Friday, we just gave some grants to some students who are doing high-tech uh, energy uh, studies. And we've just completed a sort of an open innovation challenge around uh, clean technology, where we had thousands of ideas, many of them from India. And we were able to team with venture capitalists, create a $200 million funding opportunity. So uh, I would think that could be a, a other companies like ours to be able to create those mechanisms so that you're funding entrepreneurs to go take solutions out into the rural areas. I think that is doable. It's happening now. All right. Well, there is, of course, a significant microfinance business in this country as well. Um, right. Let me just ask that final question about whether we're going to be having exactly the same debate this time next year or there is a mood for significant change. Let me ask you, Mr. Myram. Uh, I'm quite confident that there'll be significant change, but looking at the size of the country, many of us may still be asking the same question. Because uh, when you're looking at a country of 1.10 billion people and spread all over the place 600,000 habitations, it would be asymmetrical. It cannot be a kind of a complete solution to the problem in two years' time or one and a half years' time. But to my mind, I, I, I would, if I was invited here, I believe I would be able to report significant movement forward on a large number of initiatives that we have spoken of, especially in institutionalizing public-private partnerships in the rural areas. Siram, um, I think, I think. Could you just have the microphone a little closer to you, please? Yeah, I think we'll probably have uh, a two, two kinds of discussions. One would agree that nothing has changed in agriculture. And what we'll also say is that there's been more access and there are new kinds of jobs that are created. So we'll have a discussion that is sort of by at one level we'll say when 57% of India is employed in agriculture, nothing has changed there. But we'll also say that there's been new opportunities that have been created uh, which look exciting uh, for the long term. 
Ben, will you still be concerned about spectrum? What, what level of connectivity will you be talking about in the rural areas a year from now? So uh, let me first uh, make an observation. It's interesting that uh, Mr. Myram got the majority of the questions, which tells me that <laughs> we're still looking to government, where I think the real issue is that we need to go way beyond that and, and from ourselves. If we ask the government to step away and then we ask government all the questions, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit unfair. So I think 12 months from now we talk about exactly the same issues. That doesn't mean that there's no progress. But we will talk about exactly the same issues. Because this is a size that unless we go and turn it into, from a problem into an opportunity, uh, and we put the factor time to it, we will be simply misguiding ourselves if we think that in 12 months time this will have to change. This won't have changed. Will we have made progress? Um, I think on some areas, yes. But on other areas, no. Because we first have to overcome our perception or what's happening there. And the problem is, it is not the rural areas sitting here on stage. It's everybody else but the rural areas sitting on stage to talk about the problem. And what about bandwidth uh, and connectivity? <laughs> I've, got, I've got to ask you, because that's important. You said it right at the beginning. 12 yes. million mobile phones, yes. new mobile phones every month in so, India. So uh, with, with the risk to, uh, to, be a, um, uh, to be, I hope that I'm wrong. I sincerely hope that I'm wrong, but I but. think it is such a political issue that it will take a little bit longer than 12 months to solve. It is wrong, it should be different, but I think reality sometimes are what they are. Ellen. No, I, I am an optimist, and I think we will. I think we have momentum, and I think we'll make progress, and I think we'll make progress on the non-controversial areas, on areas where we have momentum, and we're going to have better examples next year. But I do think that there are some significant um, steps that the government has to take around some of the thornier issues, like genetically modified organisms and food, um, that unless we can get that moving, that you're not going to see a step change in productivity. Elizabeth. Yeah, I, I would think a year from now things will be better. I'm like Ellen, I'm feeling very optimistic. For a company like ours, we're committing an unprecedented level of resources to, to, to figuring out how do we help here, how, how do we grow our business. So that's, that's key. And I think a company, many of us on, in business also represent the idea of scalability. So we have the ability to take, uh, take something that's working in one community and work with another community to, to, to mirror it and get it going. So I think those two things are, are going to play out positively. OP Bhatt, do you see significant changes, not least in mindsets? Yes, yes, because, you know, the speed of change has improved tremendously globally and in India. This change is being led, or the speed of change is being led by technology, but also by institutional enablement, by awareness, and by, you know, the demand, the pull, the demand pull from the people. So what I am looking at is that, you know, in India, if you look at entrepreneurship, if you look at innovation, if you look at the sheer quality of IQ among Indians, I think they have demonstrated that they are one of the best in the world. There are millions of small, small people across the country who are working on these places for rural development, for upliftment of the poor, via technology, via agriculture, via biotech, so many things. What I think is going to happen is that a critical tipping point may reach. Now, whether the tipping point comes in one year, two years, three years, I'm not sure. But I can see that the core is aggregating, the core of entrepreneurship, core of innovation, it is all aggregating. And if you were to reach the tipping point before we next meet, we shall all be talking differently. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. In an hour and 15 minutes, there's a limit to what we can cover, but I hope we've ended at least on an optimistic note, despite the enormous challenges. And I guess we'll all promise ourselves to reconvene here this time next year to find out whether this audit and prediction uh, is right, given the scale of the problem. Thank you very much indeed.